I'm going to first tell you so that the people that may not know about our work, I'm going to try to introduce it quickly. I entered medical school in 1967 as a political activist who was going to add medicine to my political activism. And I studied whole systems before I went into medical school, and I didn't have to study much in medical school, so I studied the history of healthcare delivery. I'm a voracious interviewer. Don't sit next to me on an airplane. Yeah. <laughs> and what I wanted to do was to show a model hospital that addressed every single problem of the way care is delivered in one model as something easy. Yeah. So you just had to read a lot and ask a lot of questions of a lot of people. And this is a solution. Hear the word A. We need 10,000 solutions to look at so then we can decide on our number 10,001. Okay, so we ran a pilot project from 1971 to 1984. Our idea, no one gave us a hospital, so the cheapest way to do anything is communal. So 20 adults, three of us doctors, moved into a large six-bedroom house and said we were a hospital. We were open 24 hours a day, seven days a week for all manner of medical problems from birth to death. Everyone was welcome. You didn't have to call ahead. And everything was free. And it wasn't that we were free for poor people. We wanted to eliminate the idea of death and the medical interaction. We never wanted you to think you owed anything. We wanted you excited you belonged to something called community, which is maybe partly why you like coming here. And so you couldn't give us money. If you wanted to donate to us, you had to wait six months from your care. Because we didn't want you to think you owed us anything. In that same flavor, we never heard anyone say anything nice about an insurance company. So we've never had anything to do with public or government insurance. Insurance companies own the practice of medicine. Probably the thing that is the loudest ugly noise for donors is that we're the only hospital that would even remotely dream to refuse to carry malpractice insurance. We need the right to make a mistake. As we are an art, not an answer. And we will give you our time. I'm a family doctor. My first interview with a new adult patient is for unbelievably intense hours. Don't think you can bring a secret. <laughs> you don't want to come to me if you want to keep something from me. What would be the point? Okay, so. Spend four hours with a patient. My experience in doing that for 45 years with countless people inside an office environment and the person sitting next to me is that I found less than 3% of the people had self-esteem. I love me. I love me. Hey, I am great. <laughs> and I found less than 5% that had any idea what a day-to-day -day vitality for life is about. And let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, if I have a medical fact, if you have food and a friend, what are you bitching about? <laughs> and so relax about your good luck to be able to live maybe 10 years, 20, 30, 40, 50, 66. Okay. So in spending that kind of time with patients, we realized that almost no one had a wellness program even basic diet exercise, much less fabulous mental health all the time. And that the average answer of a patient was, cut the crap, doc, give me a pill. So we had to trick people. Okay, so didn't look like a hospital. It was a communal farm. We were farmers. We were an artist colony. We were an insane asylum where you couldn't tell staff from patients. <laughs> and so we had wild, all 
night dances two or three times a week to dance? No, to trick people into aerobics. <laughs> ethic of fast dancing. The hell with exercise. I'm enjoying myself. <laughs> we also realized very quickly that allopathic medicine, which is what an MD is, is uh, needs help. In fact, it's not the only player on the playground. And so from the very first, we allowed every practitioner of even what you've heard, heard here in Oregon. We let every practitioner come there as long as they didn't charge money and let us watch. And of course, we found great things in everything, mostly through the hands of the healer who carried them. We also realized when you spend four hours with a person and you really try to understand their life and every single thing that's important to them, you realize that healthcare has systems. We learned cardiovascular, respiratory, genital, urinary, but that there was a connection between those systems and political, economic, social, environmental, and educational systems that were actually having a more devastating effect on health than the organ systems were. And so there was a climate of discussion that was off subjects like TV and on subjects of peace and justice and care confrontation, we totally discourage patient confidentiality. Let's get public. <laughs> As you know, the difference between that environment and all of the closure environments. We did the work for 12 years. No one gave us a single donation. We had 1,400 foundation rejections. And to my knowledge, for 40 years, we've been the only hospital in the world fully addressing health care delivery issues in an active model. And I correspond with doctors and nurses in 120 countries. And they're all crying out for us. So the month-long elective that we have for medical students in October, last time we had medical students who are already poor, paying their way for a month at a place that doesn't even have a place they can see patients to spend a month in humanism. And last year it was medical students from Japan, the Philippines, seven countries of Europe, Brazil, Canada, Mexico, and the U.S. Hungry to spend a month on the subject of humanism. That would be us. Humanism. Well, uh, we stopped seeing patients after 12 years because we realized it was more important to build a model than continue seeing patients. And so, we knew it sold in America, and that was publicity, so I knew that meant me. And so we've been climbing that fame and fortune ladder, even lowering ourselves to the bone to have <clears throat> a movie made of one's life and have to enter the world of fame in order to try to serve humanity. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm a servant. I'm the person you may not know who swept the floor, who cleaned the toilets, who, when the commune was open, listened to all the jobs nobody liked and took those. That's what I like. I want to be what the patient people are frightened of. The ones with no solutions, the one who can't go to sleep at night. And so, you can't just be a fundraiser and have the kind of fun that I like. And I figured we have to start working for peace. We thought as poor an organization as we were in 1984, one thing we could do was to love our enemy. And in those years, it was the Soviet Union. We took our first clown trip to Russia. This year is the 28th year of going to Russia. Anybody can come. We've taken ages 3 to 88. You can be the dullest person on the planet, the least performing, most pathetic, self-hating human in the world. And we want you. We want four or five of you in a costume. We know that when you're taken to the horror of human suffering, you forget that crap and find your loving, giggly self. One exciting thing that's happened this year is that we're really 
You know, last year, 6,000 vets killed themselves. 6,000! That's how allergic we are to war. And so we're trying to get uh, funding to take vets on clown trips, to have them reconnect with their loving by going to hardcore suffering and to see themselves save a life from love. 20 years ago, we realized that uh, we just hated what we saw in the orphanages. To give you an example, I've been in over 2,000, and the Russians rank as some of the scummiest. You, know, you don't want to know. And so we said, let's take care of our own kids. And now through a group called Maria's Children, we're involved in over 400 Russian children's lives in Moscow and St. Petersburg. And then we said, what the hell? Let's, uh, let's go to war. Let's take clowns into refugee camps. And now we've done about 170 trips. We do nine this year. Ecuador, Kenya, Guatemala, Sicily, the Amazon of Peru, Costa Rica, Gaza, Brazil, and Russia, just for the fun of it. And you are welcome. That's Adams.org. Get the e-newsletter. We also have emergency trips. We were in Haiti right after the earthquake. At times, we've been able to build clinics and schools in other countries, and uh, we invite you to come. Everyone is welcome. It's a great trip if you're struggling with somebody in your family. It's a great trip to reconnect in your romance. I believe my children, both of them, sons, 35 and 24, work with me because <laughs> I tricked them into coming on a clown trip. <laughs> so... That's a part of our life that's really grown. We call it our global outreach program. And um, I'm going to have uh, my assistant, Kate, Kate, stand up and be obnoxious. Thank you. <laughs> if you're interested in signing up or doing anything, uh, see Kate. She may or may not be in purple hair. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, let me tell you other exciting things. Last month. We started building our first big building, and it is absolutely great. <laughs> no, I don't know if you've wanted something for 40 years and didn't even get remotely close and still kept the high. I haven't had one second of discouragement. Working for love is its own juice, and it's unlimited. It is thrilling. This year we've also built our third large building, and we're really feeling big things are happening in our, in our life. And that's uh, really exciting also, because I, I've been in a long-distance relationship for 19 years of long-distance. You know, I'm a person that can wait. And, and uh, the week before I came to camp went a rainbow, and then to here, I moved in with Susan, so I'm now in Illinois. I'm Midwestern corn fed boy. And I, and I moved because that big building said, you're going to live there. You're going to see patients soon. And it's feeling like that. Another interesting thing that happened last month is that what some would say the most prestigious medical journal in the world, Lancet out of England, has invited me to do a monthly column. Yeah. Okay. So now, what are the situations in healthcare all over the world? I haven't had any letters from any of the countries that don't scream it. It's hierarchy in medicine. That everywhere in the world, a doctor can walk into a nursing station, be rude, and everyone has to be at. To be professional is silent. That hierarchy, power over another human being, can never look good to me. And I got in a lot of trouble in medical school because I have a terrible problem with silence. And so, at our hospital, we want to eliminate hierarchy so the cleaning person and the surgeon make the same salary. $300 a month. Ooh. How do you do it? 
with their families living together in a communal eco village because, you know, our hospital is really a trick to get people into a university of human culture, how to get along, that there are other insurances than paper in companies that don't give a crap about you. There's the insurance of usness, of we, and that's what our hospital will be, is that we, a person go, how the hell can you operate a hospital in this U.S. country at 10% of the cost? Hear me, 10%. That's magic from the stage. 10% wow. of the cost. And no one's giving up anything. No sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And that's why thousands of doctors and nurses from all over the world beg to work there every year. Beg to do it. And that's why we really have worked to show the model rather than to do something less to get trailers. We've already did the 12 years of trailers and something that no one's going to want to repeat because it was too intense. I mean, if you can imagine, during those 12 years, we had 500 to 1,000 people in our home each month in a six-bedroom house with 20 adults and their children living there. There never was a time there were not disturbed people in the home all the time, and they were surrounded by a much larger group of needy people people hungry for anybody to give them one second of their time that looked like it was for them. And that was our life. And the chaos of actually never being farmers, because we were overeducated, and we were learning to be farmers, learning how to live with ourselves and each other and raise our kids. And every second it was need, 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 overwhelming. And uh, no one left the first nine years. We made no money. The staff had to pay outside jobs. They had to work outside to raise money so they could pay to practice medicine in a climate of no privacy 24-7. And I say that because that's the power of giving yourself over to the wealth of care. I mean, I can just show you. If I were in your town and needed a place to stay, who would put me up? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that's yours, if you can. I'm just free to ask for it, because I think if you're freely giving, you catch up at some point and freely ask for it. And also, much more developed, freely receiving the stuff that is coming into you graciously. Okay, so that's us. We are, there's a lot more things that are happening. Uh, e even the people who work with me don't know a fraction of them. We are going to build. We're going to build. Let me give you one example of your own community, and then we'll throw it open to questions, comments, arguments. It's not unusual for a family of four to spend $14,000 a year in health insurance. Okay, $14,000 in a world where half the people in the world live on $2 a day, and half of them on $1 a day for health insurance, people say, and give it up quite readily, $14,000 a month, okay, or $14,000 a year. Now do the math. If you get 10,000 of those people together in one year, that's $140 million. Ding, ding, ding! How much does Patch need for his hospital? Oh, $140 million! 40 to build, 100 to endow, next hospital. Okay, it's a community hospital, right? So the next year you give your same $14,000 to yourself with nine other groups doing that, and then you have $1.4 billion. That, of course, builds your referral tertiary care hospital. Debt free, my second year of insurance money you are throwing away that doesn't build your community one bit. 10,000 families got it together to build their own hospital. Imagine how much of a trick that is to make you be a community beyond something known in this country.
Okay, can I give you two books to please? I'll give you four books to read. The two books we recommend to all people in medical school or nursing school or healing school. <laughs> and I've just put my 35,000 volume library catalog, it'll soon be on the computer, well organized. So I'm just teasing you, because all of those are my friends. Okay, the two books we recommend to health students are The Nature of Suffering by Eric Castle. These are two very well-known names in, in, uh, in medical literature. And Arthur Kleinman, The Illness Narrative. And then a lot of you know my opinions about psychiatry, psychiatric medicine, psychiatric diagnosis. And there's a really important book, I think, written by Robert Whitaker called Anatomy of an Epidemic. I beg you at least, if you are considering naming your child some psychiatric name or giving them some pill for that psychiatric name, read this book and see if you actually want to do it. You can call me up and argue with me about whether or not you want to do it. Robert Whitaker, Anatomy of an Epidemic. An all sort of book, because the absolute worst thing I've ever seen in my life as a family doctor is loneliness. There is no more devastating experience in human life than loneliness. In fact, one of its symptoms is what is called a disease, but is simply a symptom, and that is depression. So it's John Cassiopo, a neuroscientist from Chicago, his book, Loneliness. Read it. You'll get on the friend thing really quickly. Okay, that's it. Let's talk. You don't have to like anything about me. You don't talk. I recite poetry. Some of you know I can go really long on a single poem. Yes. Okay, thank you for asking where. Okay, we are building our hospital in Pocahontas County, West Virginia. West Virginia is considered the least served state in the United States. We have 310 acres, three waterfalls, caves behind the waterfalls, a four acre lake, a mountain of hardwood trees. And if you were there tonight, you would see a minimum of two million fireflies shooting at you on the hillside. So it's it's in the oldest landmass area on the planet, the oldest river of the world. The new river is right there. We found 400 million year old coral on the land. So, yeah. Hot fire! Can you say hot fire? Hot fire! How about hot fire, honey? Okay, y'all come. Okay, somebody else? Yes, ma'am. How did we... Where did we start? Okay, the 12 years we saw patients, you had to get your monthly thing together. Which for me and for all of the people living communally, food, rent, electricity, phone, was you had to get $250 together each month. So, you know, a doctor can do that by mid-morning, have the rest of the day off. And so what I did, what I did is I went to people that I knew had excess money and said, look, you can get 100 hours a week of active medical work for me for $3,000 a year. So that's how I did it, because I'm shameless. You know, the thing is, the real answer to how you do it is, I'm going to do it. Okay? If you've ever done anything, how do you do it? It's because you say, I'm doing it. You're going to fail. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. What's that? In the Andes, where we are, we've been in Peru for 10 years. Seven years ago, we found five-year-old children with gonorrhea in Iquitos, in the Peruvian Amazon. And we already have been involved in trying to end child sexual slavery. If you don't know, it's 20 to 50 million men a day. Feel how much I don't like it. 
okay, five-year-old children. And so we said we're going to stay there for our lifetime. So we, we've been there seven years. Last year, our August trip took 135 people from 14 countries. So we have a lot of friends in Peru. My son's right now in Peru learning to be fluent in Spanish. So, yes, we've, we've actually been in most of the countries of Central and South America. Do we use gardens as healing avenue? If I said one, two, three, would you say duh? <laughs> um, one, two, three. Duh. Okay. Um, you know, there it was, the 60s and overeducated people and communes. What was the first thing you did? You did a garden. And then you realized, wait, it's not just watering seeds. <laughs> ah. Yes, and it moved to permaculture and then, you know, that cloth salad of things you learn. And, and remember, we're going to trick people with their diseases to come and look at it. You know, they have time during the day, you'll drag them out to the garden, you've got permaculture of plants and animals, and you might include a human. Yes. Yeah. Did, but what was before that? Did I have any... Well, this is a big thing that happened last year in September in front of a large bank of cameras on Children's Day in Costa Rica. I had the president of Costa Rica in my large underpants with me in stage. So, you know, and in January, the vice president of Ecuador. So I'm working with the politicians. You know, my partner and I stumped for Dennis Kucinich around the country for the election before last. And uh, we, in the last year here, we did have a, a conference on Capitol Hill. And, and so we, we were constantly offering. And, you know, don't stand next to me, whoever you are, as a politician. And we tried. You know, we're not owned by somebody else. I mean, if we're owned by something, we're owned by the inexcusability of anybody hurting anybody. Just the raw, unbelievable, inexcusableness of hunger if somebody else is eating. Sorry. Old starvation. If you haven't held enough starving children in your arms, come with me. Yes. Great. Have I ever had trouble with my any licensing board because I uh, of my unconventional uh, practice? You know, if you saw the Hollywood movie, they condense your life down into something. So the real person murdered was my closest male friend in medical school, and it happened six years after medical school. Okay, and so they they crammed what happened five years after medical school graduation uh, when I, when the Maryland board refused me a license because of that. And I hope they read all the letters patients sent them. You know, uh, authorities. <laughs> what do you do with them? You know, I'm nonviolent. I'm not going to protect my family. I'm not going to hurt somebody. So I have to do something else. And, uh, I haven't lost the license, and I'm going to the poorest state and offering total free care with no state funds. I wouldn't want to be the person that closed this down. I wouldn't want to be that judge. Uh, and the thing is, I don't know about you and law. Some law, it re law is intelligent. Using a select law to improve the lives of a tiny portion of the people makes me start rubbing about injustice. So, there, you know, the presumption of medical licenses, imagine how big that category is for me if we really got down to it. And so just know it's a volcano. And you can 
take my license away. I'm going to be a doctor. You understand that? I'm a doctor. Shoot me, and that's how you stop me. Yes, ma'am. Lose their cobra? Oh, if it was a pet cobra, I'd say, you know, go the other way. <laughs> well, I mean, advice. Of course, you've been hearing my advice, right? Organize, create your own hospital, your own clinic, and, uh, and does a person really want that kind of answer when they ask that kind of question? A specific next step, of course, is maximum wellness program. Okay, that's the initial step before you even think you might ever lose your insurance. Because it's, isn't it weird? The healthier you are, you never use this horrible thing you're spending a giant quantity of money for. So let's say you've been healthy for 40 years and you gave $14,000 each year and you never used it. Somebody got a bargain. So, you could say, this is the time to organize local insurance, which in a way, in the insurance industry grew up around teachers. And uh, so, wellness, organize, don't pay your bill. You know, the thing is, if it's an emergency, they have to take care of you. And and what I recommend to people, since it's way overcharged, it's irresponsible. In fact, for my, in my mind, there, there are too many children present to say what I actually think about the cost of things. And, and I, you understand, every day, every day, I get letters and phone calls from people who are weeping in your position. So I want people to, uh, to organize, in a way, you have to think about at least three generations down to have a medical system that you like. But to be passive, Wisconsin should be your everyday gesture. Okay? That should say, okay, well, yeah. That was, you know, a month-long revolution. What's a hundred-year revolution? So, band together, meet rich people. You know, another way to meet rich people is band together with poor people. And you know, that's really would be my technique. You know, share. Let's. How is it that we don't share? I mean, even really rotten people, when they share something, get high from the sharing. It's so interesting. You know, really unbelievable, horrible people. Only I can get with them and really enjoy myself. And they love giving. Who they are choosing to give is. You know what I'm trying to hit them up with. You know, be nervous. Because if you don't have a job, you can't afford a pimple. <laughs> and always keep in your mind, half the world lives on less than two dollars a day, half of them on less than one. And and here's a trick I know. You know, I've learned to be so friendly, so fun to be with, with so many skills. I'm covered. Here's what you do, okay? You lose everything. Here's how you stay with a person, all right? Love washing dishes. Love giving lots of time to the children. And bake great bread. No one is going to throw you out of their house if they have children. Are you feeling relief? Okay. Really good bread or really good children will mean that you don't have to do the other two nearly as well. So the thing is, we have a brain. If we actually stayed here and we weren't allowed to leave until we had a thousand suggestions for you, we would start getting an idea of what I mean by using the brain. Over billions of cells with so many connections among themselves, we have no idea. How are we doing? Ding, 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 ding. Be inquiring, be confrontational, ask the horrible question. Yes.
meetings with. Okay. Well, why don't you come up here and get cuddly? <laughs> so you can, because I want them, I don't want to paraphrase your pain. Okay. Yum, yum. Oh, you moved in with Susan. <laughs> Hey, you know, a really important thing to know about relationships is you can have a lot of friends. And that the boundaries with them disappear if you're really great with the commitments that you bring. <laughs> Please tell these people. This is a microphone. Oh, it's not just a friendly experience. Uh, he came to Portland uh, a lot of years ago when one of our midwives got murdered and we did a whole benefit. So I saw you up in Portland in Oregon, back way back then. Anyway, I'm a bachelor's from Fairfield Public School. And I have a daughter who's a nurse. And I have a daughter who's a prepared nurse. And I've done a lot of good things. And a lot of times I get in trouble because it's like you did your story. But I thought I had a really good job doing a whole wellness medical home model program in the internal medicine department. And um, I had about 200 clients. But I had to go to so many meetings. My clients were just squeezed in between the meetings. And um, I don't know. And I want to know how to be within the system to help change the system. Not to yeah, and who did you work for that made you have meetings? Oregon Health Sciences University. Of okay. Thank you very much. I mean, the, the first thing I would say is practice saying goodbye. <laughs> Thank you. I now know my path. You know, I, I hope I came here for you. I wanted you to hear, when I was in medical school, I wasn't thinking up a hospital for patients. I couldn't get that far. I was thinking for one that would make me blissed out to be there. And the entire design of our hospital is to bliss out the staff. They're so disgustingly happy, you actually have to have police put them to bed. <laughs> and so, You know, the brain, please hear me. If I sell you on anything today, you could be in a jail like Nelson Mandela for 27, <laughs> 28 years and come out happy. Sorry. So, as soon as you come up against the wall of something you don't like, you say, what's the design? This is what I want. We do five-day intensives on healthcare delivery system design, where you come with two hungers. What do I want? What's the design? And a climate of people who are going, I want? Here's me. And uh, so the, the great thing is when you step into a system, I think a little bit of your imagination goes, unless it's a system that sprinkles your imagination. Here's your opportunity to find qualities of your imagination in nursing, you actually haven't explored. By the way, you asked the question. Just put that first. You know, we are an unbelievably sick nation. Everybody! We're happy. Clearly, sometimes being fired is wisdom. She got fired. She was wrong for their system. One, two, three. Oh. No, duh. <laughs> First time in theater? Okay. So, really? Okay. okay, so, no, this is so important. You know, and maybe I'm here more for people who want to give health care in a beautiful way. There's a website, and how do I know? Not because I actually have seen it, because I don't know how to use a computer. But it's either... IMP or ideal medical practice. And it's not your ideal. No. It's a place you can go where you read about other people's way that they are trying an ideal. And if you really talk with them, is it their ideal? It's nearly there. And because I, I'm, an, I'm an ideal that I haven't had what I wanted, right? It is really near. And the 12 years that we had our vision of an ideal in the crude an embarrassing way it was in those days. And it was. You know, we had pneumonias in the hallways. 
uh, I mean, it was an embarrassment to what we were taught in medicine. And if you go to the third world, you can go to a clinic that has uh, an anti-inflammatory, an antibiotic, and then sometimes a third medicine. And you go, am I a doctor? So, you know, this is an opportunity because what we need in this is not to find a way, find a way to work in the system. The system, whatever system you're talking about almost these days sucks and is dangerous and is eating people up and has found a way in the most rich nation in the world to be comfortable refusing care to 50 million people and giving unhappy care to all of the rich people. You know, you're not hearing people going, boy, the hospital, I wanted to stay two more weeks. <laughs> and that's at Johns Hopkins or Mayo Clinic. So, you know, show the way. Why is anyone here interested, you know? I, I, my show is stopping something you don't like and going for something you do like. Okay, uh, last question. You know what? Oh, I, okay, I'm new to the country fair in a way. Can I pass that? Yeah. Okay, great. So, um, why, don't, why doesn't Morgan take the hat and you take the addresses and other things? Okay, Morgan will be at the back. Or what's the easiest? Oh, wait, wait, this person is pointing over here or pointing for a question. Okay, one moment. Is that my granny? <laughs> granny, she, she wouldn't. Books on biological systems that I have. Okay? <laughs> Thank you very much. Love you.